while we transition, I'll invite David and Mary and, and Nico to come on down. And I'll start with in my introduction of Mary Minow, who, among other things, besides being a fellow at the Berkman Center, is one of my bosses at DPLA, thankfully. Come on, come on down. Um, and I want to acknowledge uh, Amy Ryan, the chair of our board, who is here, who now I can't see where she is. Uh, and Brian Bannon is here from Chicago as well in the back row. And I'm scanning to make sure I'm not missing any other of my bosses. Um, but thank you. And, and that exhortation, Bob, of taking risks is something they're responsible for digesting and helping, helping us work through. Uh, with that, I'm going to introduce my friend Nico Melli, who runs the Shorenstein Center down the road, who I will just preface by saying he's got a great library origin story should he share? Should he care to share it? Which one is that? The one about your birth in West Africa. Oh yes! Oh yes! Yes! Uh, but that's kind of a long story. So <laughs> maybe we will uh, ask me at the ask me at the reception. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I think of John Bracken as my boss in many ways, uh, intellectual and otherwise. It's a real delight. I was thinking, uh, I'm right now reading Vartan Gregorian's autobiography, and one of the things he talks in there that when he wants to know about the future, when he thinks about where we're going, he turns to teachers, librarians, and journalists. And I thought, ha, huh, I'm a teacher, here's a journalist, and there's a librarian. <laughs> so... Um, uh, to my left is David Beard, a media executive and contributor to Pointer.org, former foreign correspondent, director of digital at the Washington Post, editor of Boston.com, uh, 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 executive of PRI. He's been uh, a well-known and prominent journalist for some time and uh, most recently was a fellow with the Shorenstein Center studying journalism and libraries. Very excited to have him here with us and um, Mary Minow is a fellow at the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society at Harvard. Uh, she was a public librarian and then a library law consultant. And as you heard, she's on the board of the Digital Public Library of America, as well as uh, the Institute of Museum and Library Services, the agency that is the primary source of federal grants for the nation's libraries. So it's a pleasure to have them both here. I'm going to start with a question for Mary. Um, uh, you know, one of the things we've been hearing a lot about in the current moment is a decline in trust in public institutions, uh, whether that be the media or political parties or, I dare say, Congress, or I think I have to say, given today, the FBI. Uh, what, and yet Americans really trust their libraries. What, what's going on there, and what, what role could libraries play in our democracy? Yes. Uh, libraries beat out your neighbors, your family, your medical providers. We're at the top. We're st still not still not over over you know seventy percent, but we're, we're we're better than anyone else. Um, so, what what is the role of the trust? What can we do with that trust? I think it's it's our time. It, we should seize this moment when everybody is distrusting the media to to use that trust. To, to add a veneer of credibility to the underlying publications. When I talk with librarians in some of the rural areas where there's less trust of the media, um, I ask them, do you still have that trust? And they say, yes. In fact, in small areas, uh, the, lo the local librarian's known by everybody, has high, high trust. But when I give them the, the media, it doesn't really help. They still don't trust the New York Times. They don't trust the Washington Post. What role can libraries play on media literacy for communities? Well, every single day I get a Google News alert on um, what libraries are doing. And uh, I checked it this morning, and there's programs going on right now at Ferndale, Michigan, Billings, Montana, Dodge City, St. Cloud. It, 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 at the grassroots level, there are programs going on all the time to teach people uh, media literacy. What is happening at the national level is also inspiring. The American Library Association is working with um, St Stony Brook uh, to do pilots on teaching media literacy at the library. And, and assuming this goes well, which it is so far, they're doing, they are doing some video testing right now. They would like to scale it up and would be looking for funding at that point. Um, 
but it's a much deeper problem than, than, than a, really a Band-Aid approach. The article that haunts me is by Dana Boyd, Did Media Literacy Backfire? I read it every week <laughs> because she says that we're fooling ourselves if we think just teaching media literacy is the answer when it's a deep structural problem. And I'm really excited. I've had a number of talks with David uh, to, 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 to look at the deeper issues. Nevertheless, what gives me hope with the media literacy front with libraries is a Pew study that came out on September 11th that divides us into five information-seeking groups, and 13% of us 13% of us um, would like to be more digitally literate and don't trust the media, but would, would are prime candidates for the libraries to, to reach out to. Uh, that's in the center. At the top, 40% or so are already coming into the library, learning digital skills, learning on their own, um, and then the bottom 50% don't know, don't care. Wow. Wow. What what has surprised you most in your work with libraries over the last few years uh, in terms of their engagement with communities and, and uh, with media literacy? What surprises me is when, I, when I've talked to them about this project that I'm working with with the Berkman Center, the, the Law Library, and Boston Public, and um, about reaching out beyond the library to that 13% using Facebook to say, um, not so sure about that article that your, your friend posted, connect with a librarian to help you check it out. I say to librarians, I say, if this really works and we scale it and we tell people, here's your local library, would you be okay with taking more, more questions? And they're like, yes, yes, we, that's what we do. We want to answer people's questions and how to figure out the authenticity of an article and how to figure out a broader view. That's, you know, and I ask people you know, in really small areas, yeah, I, I always get a yes. That surprises Excellent. me. Uh, I'm going to turn to David now. Um, I would highly recommend everyone. David has a recent piece uh, published, I guess, just uh, a couple of days ago in The Atlantic on libraries and small town news. And the piece opens with uh, the story of a, of a tragic school shooting in Cleveland. Can you tell us that story and tell us what that means? Sure. Um, it was a, a student who came into the cafeteria before school and had fired. There was a CNN alert, but an alum of the school, Marilyn Johnson, who some of you may know from her book, uh, This Book is Overdue, I think, about uh, librarians and librarians and the future of libraries, uh, was from Chardon, Ohio. And she saw the most accurate uh, subsequent reports, fact-based, substantial, in this emergency situation from the Facebook page of her library, wh where the vigil will be. What the, and, 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 and it struck her because, you know, she... Uh, her book was less than two years, just two years old at this time, how she had overlooked um, that the information center of a community would be the information disseminator for the community too. It's a, it's a non-traditional role and uh, in some ways, other than the flyers on the event coming up or which author will be in town. But um, the other piece of the puzzle was everybody else was gone. The local paper was gone. The, the, the representative for that town from the big paper now has to cover 15 communities instead of two. So uh, even in communities like Skokie, uh, close to Chicago, vibrant, you know, there's a, there's a total dearth. You would Mike Berkeley, news deserts, you know. So um, I, I wanted to see what librarians, if anything, were doing to sort of fill that vacuum. And what, what did you find? I know, talk a little bit about South Dakota. Oh, yeah. So, well, I, I feel like I was just following some of John Bracken's early grants with, uh, in San, San Antonio or maybe in South Dakota uh, to see if a uh, few of these pioneers had survived the shakeout of hyper-local and citizen journalists. And in, um, in South Dakota, uh, a visionary state library board member uh, saw a chance to unite 13 libraries and create a website and, uh, and deliver some news, but based on, not on a police blotter, but based on changes in census uh, data town by town or changes in, in, um, in GDP information, just, just material that would be very vibrant, important for officials and others to make good decisions in government. That wasn't being done. And then as weeklies closed, the other stuff wasn't being done too. So um, 
So uh, the Black Hills uh, Information Network became sort of a de facto information source for uh, a chunk of uh, Northwest South Dakota. And as we're facing a future where uh, the number of uh, journalists in the United States is uh, at about 20, uh, 18 to 20 percent, the level it was at 14 years ago, uh, we're seeing just a really rapid decline in the volume and availability of local news. What, what do libraries have to bring to that vacuum? What do they have that maybe journalists and newsrooms don't have? Um, trust is the first thing. Uh, I, I don't know if you know Paola Villanueva from Creative Commons and a Berkman uh, Fellow. Uh, she said, you're just trying to bring, get journalists and librarians to date each other. And I said, well, if they had a love child, it would have an approval rating in the 60s. But, um, <laughs> But so trust is a big component, um, and, and active listening and understanding of, of, of the audience and understanding of the authenticity of each community. I, I've been loath to start top-down templates for success for various people because I want to listen to see what solutions have been done on a menu of options by the pioneering libraries that are doing things, stepping into this. Um, I think that uh, as in journalism, uh, librarians understand uh, what makes their community different and ask the question, although some might call it a Passover question about why is this town different from any other town. Um, every moment, every day, every aspect from history to disproportionate statistical representation. So in the section of information um, that is about that local area, uh, I think librarians, libraries have a much better handle than out-of-town chain places that are paying some stranger to come in at age 22 to figure out a town. Mary, I just wonder if you want to comment on this, on this role that libraries are, are, are beginning to fill in different ways. Well, Dave and I have been talking a lot about the structural problems of um, the, the closing of these small papers makes people in small towns say, we don't have a voice. We're being preached to by the elites on the coast, and, and the, the resentment and the divide grows wider. So I think that what libraries have to offer um, is, is manifold. We've been passing around some ideas of having a resident journalist, a, you know, stay, stay in the library and be there to, 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 write question, to write stories and answer questions and teach Literacy, news literacy, and what does the library can offer back is um, some space, some expertise, the local files, the contacts. There's, there's libraries have amazing tap on resources um, that that journalists could actually learn from the librarians. This could be a really good partnership. I would add that the journalists would think, and there there are some really great outreach people in libraries that libraries that get this too. Uh, the the idea of broader dissemination of 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 what you have and and a selectivity of for the audience which let's say you've got uh, like like uh, um, like BPL you know sixty three invaluable databases who's your audience and will will database thirty seven with this particular use case light up and get these people to go from the list of, of databases to the muscle memory to use it more often. So, so I, think, I think journalists are good at getting the word out um, for that. And, and I think there is a, a, a new sort of digital specialist or outreach specialist or whoever is doing the weekly newsletter, email newsletter for the library that will be, become much more muscular, I think, in, in coming years. And so the new role of a community library uh, may evolve into just a de facto town crier. It won't just be library events. It'll be library plus town events, too, because there wasn't the other side anymore. You know, and, and libraries, at least public libraries, the role has been changing to be less of a repository, although it's certainly a huge value in that, but more of a content creation space for their users. So as maker spaces come into play, as recording studios, as, as poetry labs, um, there, there really is a, a synergy there for creation of local, local content. And I would also, I mean, the other impetus for me is this is sort of a rear guard action to protect some aspect of the First Amendment in areas where it has either been gone or, or the news desert. It's, it's sort of a seeding 
of, of an area, of a, of a barren area in some cases, and if there is greater interest in local um, sort of accountability journalism that would be on the, you know, ken of the library if they're paid by, people are paid by the mayor, um, that you may stoke a kind of community that could support a broader, different news, news thing again. So this is, this is happening, in, this could happen, I imagine, in communities far from uh, the battles in Washington over the press or, uh, or other places. This is, this, is, uh, the, this is red America. These are small town America. This is places where um, uh, they, they hate journalists because they didn't have a local journalist, much like unbridled hatred for Congress except for your local congressman. That we took out the local congressman here from media. Uh, I have a couple more questions, but maybe I should just open it up to the audience for a moment and see if there are any questions from the audience. And if not, I will keep going. Speak now. Yes. Excuse me for speaking up, uh, having just spoken in the previous panel, but David, I'm a little skeptical about the library as a newspaper. Uh, I, it seems to me that people like you, journalists, have real skills and you write stories. Now, it's true that libraries are centers for information and they can help people get there, but it seems to me the problem is much more profound than leaning harder on libraries. 62% uh, of Americans get their news from the social media, mainly um, uh, Facebook. And the, the stuff that comes onto that media is not produced by trained professionals who know how to get a story. So it seems to me we are stuck in a very severe crisis as far as news goes. Right. I, I'm, I'm, your point is taken. I don't think that um, there, there are a few places where the librarian, town librarian has ended up running, in essence, the town weekly newspaper, but it's it's four or eight pages, you know, uh, two, two 11 by 17 uh, uh, pages folded together and dropped off at a few local spots. It is mostly it was what I would call proto journalism. It's not it's not the deep stuff. It's just this town's um, senior seniors club didn't realize this town also had a seniors exercise club, and so all of a sudden when you have the announcements going out, they're doubling the size of people that show up for the kids Santa Lions Club thing. It's a very fundamental first edge of, of community. So I, I don't see it as, a, as New York Times journals. I don't know what to do. Uh, um, some parts of that 62% in social media. I do know that, that, uh, that local information is not as replicable or as representative. People will know in a second when, uh, when Elvis died but they won't know who owned your house in 1960. You know, so you need to have a local database to get that. So it may be unearthing, some, unlocking the unique information that each community might have. And I want to add to that. I mean, it's certainly not investigative journalism or, or high-level uh, output. But the problem is so severe that having just these scenes in the ground, I think, is important. We have nothing in, in so many spaces. So to have something that then can perhaps start to grow and, and journalists might come back, or you know, we've got, it's better than a fallow field, is how, how I see it. What, what other challenges do you see facing, uh, facing libraries in oh, the... Yeah. I'm glad you asked that. Um, what do we do with all this junk? I mean, do, do, do we, how do we curate this? Do we collect it? Do we believe in, in access to everything? Or do we don't believe in labeling things? Um, when it came to Holocaust denial literature, you wouldn't believe how much time and thought and arguments went into coming up with a, with a call number to keep it separate. And that was not even a, really an, a, 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 that was an objective uh, distinction, whether it's denying or whether it's actually Holocaust literature. So how do we handle this? How do we curate uh, with, and keep that trustworthiness and still have free to all access? That's, the Simmons is having a conference in April, no news, K-N-O-W-N-E-W-S, to deal with that problem and to bring together technologists, journalists, and librarians to figure out how to, how to move forward. I was going to say also there, 
there's a lot of interest uh, in, in various schools who have contacted me after a few of these stories and have said, we, we, we see we need some skills that journalists have in our iSchools, and iSchools would say we need some of, or um, um, journalism schools would say we need some of these skills that, uh, that you know, information science and library science people have as well, and there may be a hybrid with new next-gen employees in libraries if they have to do a little, I guess, extreme outreach or sort of answering the existential question. Um, maybe it's somebody who has both the, the research and, and um, tools and the sort of uh, some dissemination skills. I, I don't know if it's more than a team taught course or if it's a, to a joint degree on the spectrum. I think, you know, when I think forward to the role of libraries, I really look to the Digital Public Library of America because um, it's creating that curate, that one spot at least where there's curated reputable content that is so important and if we spend all our time just slashing at the stuff that's bad that's what we're that's we'll end up with nothing i think building the good content is the best role the highest role for libraries i i had a friend who was uh in college in the vietnam war and was disbelieving everything he was reading in the paper so he went to the library he opened up all the books and he found out the li that the, what he was reading was lies we need we need that going forward. How, how is he going to find those books um, unless we have some, some reputable uh, DPLA-type platform? One last question. Yes, sir, in the back. So I would like your comments on uh, an experiment that's a little over a year uh, underway at DPL right now, which is kind of the final piece of the, the renovation that, that was started under Amy Ryan's leadership. And that's where we have WGBH now with a full broadcast studio for news and radio inside the central library. That's a value to GBH to bring you know, new uh, listeners and viewers of the radio, yes, viewers of the radio, um, uh, in person um, to the library, but it's also drawing others to the library who wouldn't have been aware of this before. So it's, it's another piece of the you know, reinvention of the library that brings together news in this new form. David, could I ask you the question, how is it working after that first year? I, it's working so well for me, I can't pass Boylston without taking a picture of the Newsfeed Cafe and posting it to my Instagram feed. I don't know why, but uh, I, I'm hoping it work, it's working out well. Social media trusted piece of this as well that you were directing yeah. on. Um, so uh, people love it, um, both uh, the, 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 the mayor was on this morning, and it's always a draw, and um, you know, to have people participating in the radio show um, by asking questions, being in dialogue. Um, I think you know, for years two and year three, the question is now, what do we do with this as a platform? Is there a way to bring about uh, an interesting opportunity for uh, training people on what, what is good journalism? How do you produce a show? Um, what is the role of news within the library context? And people have come to the library to read newspapers for generations. So I think we're still in the early stages of working out what that means, but, but the promise is very encouraging, and the response is really well. I would, I would say maybe if you haven't already, to look at, uh, at uh, the San Antonio uh, system and the uh, studios that they have primarily for training uh, with the Teen Services Division and uh, the sort of independent sort of video C-SPAN for uh, San Antonio that's all produced in a newsroom inside of that main library building. So I think uh, our panelists have done an excellent job of trying to, uh, with wisdom, light the way towards the future a bit. I mean, we're facing this giant rushing flow of dis and misinformation on social media, in part, I believe, because of the collapse of journalism. And libraries have a role both in navigating some of the challenges of mis and disinformation and in in providing a potential future for some communities, at least, on, um, on, on local news. And I thought since Mary had the foresight and wisdom to bring up Poetry Labs, I thought it'd be worth closing with a, a couple of brief stanzas from Mark Strand. Um, <clears throat> there is no happiness like mine. Ink runs from the corners of my mouth. I have been eating poetry. 
And the last stanza is, I am a new man. I growl at the librarian and bark. I romp with joy in the bookish dark. Thank you.